this today. Uh, it's a pleasure to have Prasad who will tell us about uh, wormholes. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, I'm going to be talking about a paper that uh, we put out a few months ago now, uh, but I haven't talked about here yet, uh, with myself, Douglas Stanford, Jen Ben Yang, and Shen Yu Yao, who the rest of them are all at uh, Stanford. Um, just this thing. Okay, so just some brief background. Um, space-time wormholes uh, been used recently to explain a lot of aspects of black holes, um, and in particular, they've been able to explain some things related to statistical aspects of black hole microstates. And while a statistical picture of black hole microstates is far from a complete picture, um, uh, these wormholes seem to be enough to probe questions related to the discreteness of the energy spectrum of the black hole. Um, and so uh, let's focus our attention on large black holes in ADS. And while ADS-CFT, of course, tells us that they have a discrete spectrum, we want to understand this from a bulk point of view. Um, and our main tool for doing this will be the spectral form factor, which I'll review briefly. So uh, we have two versions of the spectral form factor. Uh, this. So one of them uh, corresponds to having a fixed temperature, K beta. And that's defined as a product of the partition function and we can analytically continue to beta, uh, from beta to beta plus IT, where T is at a time. And you take the modulus squared, and then you do some sort of averaging. Um, the averaging can depend on the system. If you have an ensemble of systems, you can average over the ensemble. If you have a fixed system, you can average the time over some small window. Um, what we're going to do doesn't really depend very much on how we're going to try to average it. Um, and so writing out these partition functions as the sums over the states, this is an ex expression for K beta. Uh, but also, uh, in the field of quantum chaos, more commonly, people consider the fixed energy version of the spectral form factor Ke. And so here I've written uh, an expression for how you'd get Ke in terms of K beta. And we, we integrate over beta over some uh, line in the uh, imaginary direction. And uh, we fix the energy around some window with width delta. Uh, and so the reason we're studying this, this spectral form factor is that at late times, uh, K beta and Ke are sensitive to the distribution of spacings between nearby energy levels. And we can roughly see that from this term here. At long times, uh, this thing will be sensitive to small differences between energies. OK, so another reason we study the spectral form factor is that at late times, in the region where it's interesting for us, uh, it has a universal behavior. And this universal behavior depends only on the, uh, the density of states of the system and some classification of your system into a small set of uh, symmetry classes where the symmetries are discrete uh, anti-unitary symmetries. Um, and the example we're going to keep in mind for this talk is just time reversal. So the universal behavior that the spectral form factor has is that it looks like what you get if you replace the Hamiltonian of your system with a Hamiltonian drawn from a certain uh, uh, ensemble of random matrices with the same symmetry class. Uh, so the examples I have here are, what if your system has no symmetries? We call that the, uh, uh, the GUE ensemble, the, the uh, ensemble of random Hamiltonians with no symmetries. In that case, the spectral form factor, after some initial non-universal decay, has a linearly growing ramp, so that uh, the ramp grows exactly linearly with a fixed coefficient for a very long amount of time until time equal to 2 pi times the density of states after which it flattens out into a plateau. If your system only has time reversal symmetry, then we say it belongs to the GOE symmetry class. Um, oh, so, sorry, was there a question I might have missed? Okay. Uh, in that case, uh, instead of having exactly linear ramp, you have this uh, curve that goes up to a plateau at late times. And we'll discuss a little bit more detail later the function that describes that curve. Um, so this, our goal roughly is to explain these, these curves, this ramp and plateau in the GUE case, or maybe eventually this, this whole curve of the GOE case uh, in gravity. So we compute the spectral form factor in gravity, try to find these features. And we're going to focus on JT gravity for the rest of the talk. Um, and ordinary JT gravity corresponds to the GUE symmetry class. So we expect a ramp and then a plateau with this sharp transition. OK. so. Let's talk about the simplest uh, leading order computations of the spectral form factor in JT gravity. Uh, so the spectral form factor 
before we fix the energy, it's just two copies of the partition function where we analytically continue them. So if we use the gravity path integral to compute it, we sum over geometries with these two asymptotic boundaries, periodic and beta plus it or beta minus it. So here I've just written the it part. Uh, when we fix the energy, beta is determined in terms of the energy. Um, so to leading order in the topological expansion of JT gravity, we just consider two disk topologies. These are the Euclidean black hole, but then analytically continued. So these, this contribution gives the initial decaying piece of spectral form factor that I said was non-universal. More interesting for our purposes is, it, is what we get by going to the next order in the topological expansion. There we have a cylindrical topology, and this turns out to give the ramp in the spectral form factor. And I'll give you a rough idea of why that's happened. So the action from the left and the right-hand side on this cylinder end up canceling. So there's a plus IT and a minus IT, the relative sign causes the actions to cancel. So you're left with the integral over the zero mode of this geometry corresponding to uh, rotating one side with, uh, with respect to the other. This relative time translation has a, uh, the zero mode has a, has a volume uh, proportional to T. So you get a contribution from this geometry, which just goes linearly in time. And that's, uh, this will find an analog of this later in a different system. So I want you guys to remember that if possible. Um, so now we can ask, so we were successful in, in computing the, the first part of this curve using just a couple of geometries in GT gravity. Can we compute the plateau by summing over uh, the rest of the topologies? Um, so hydrogenous surfaces in JT gravity are suppressed by powers of e to the minus s naught. Um, and roughly that's like one, e to the minus s naught is like one over the density of states. Um, so you get it, you, you would get an expansion uh, in powers of e to the, uh, e to the minus s, uh, and that is not what the plateau looks like. And so it turns out that uh, these, this series of corrections from higher genus services cancels out in Ke of t. Uh, uh, and uh, that's necessary if we, if, we, if we expect there to be an exactly linear ramp with no corrections. Um, so in the genus expansion, uh, we often think about this plateau as actually non perturbative uh, one rough way to think about that is that if uh, we can view the, the uh, uh, genus expands parameter e to the minus s naught as something like a string coupling constant. So e to the minus s naught is g string. Uh, if you look at the Fourier transform of the spectral form factor, so the Fourier transform variable is delta e. So I'll call the Fourier transform the spectral form factor rho of e and delta e. This thing behaves as like e to the i rho delta e. So it oscillates extremely rapidly in delta e. When we view e to the minus s as like a, a, a string coupling, this is like a d brain effect. It goes like e to the number times one over g string. Um, so it might seem like we won't, wouldn't be able to get in a simple way this plateau from a nice sum over geometries. Um, but what we're going to see in a moment is that we can do we, we can use a little bit of a trick where we consider instead k beta rather than k of e, k e of t. The rough idea is that at fixed energy, k e of t has a sharp transition from the ramp to the plateau. And that sharpness is reflected in this non-perturbative uh, oscillatory behavior. But when we uh, compute k beta of t, we sum over the different energy windows. And because the, the time at which this transition of the plateau happens depends on the energy, when you sum over energy windows, it ends up smoothing out this sharp kink into a smooth function, which will have a convergent topological expansion. So now let's, let's discuss this. Um, so for the GUE symmetry class, we can write a formula or a proposal for a formula for K beta uh, as follows. So K beta is just what, is what you get by integrating the Ke of T over energy weighted by a Boltzmann factor. If we apply this naive ramp plateau formula for Ke of t, where it's just all right, written it as the minimum of t over two pi and rho of e, um, this sort of function is a, is, a, is a reasonable guess for what k beta of t would look like. However, we have to be careful because um, near zero, en zero energy, the density of states is becoming very small. Um, their uh, fluctuations around this, this ramp and plateau structure might be large. And you can see in practice that it's true in something like 
the matrix integral corresponding to JT gravity or other double scale matrices. So to get around this complication, we can take a certain scaling limit. What we do is we fix the ratio of T and E to the, minus, e to the S naught, and we send T and E to the S naught to infinity. We're gonna to refer to this from now on as the tau scaling limit. So tau is just like a rescaled time. And the idea now is that the density of states is uh, infinitely large in this limit for all E's that are finite. Um, and so basically this, this ramp plateau behavior, we, uh, we, which we expect to be uh, a good approximation as we take the density very large, uh, that's, that becomes a good approximation down to zero energy for this limit. Um, and so as a, as a more general comment, we expect this, this folded ramp plateau uh, formula for K beta to be exact for all double scale matrix integrals in this limit, though I'm not gonna really discuss uh, any other than JT gravity in another you know, limit of JT gravity. Okay, so now what we can do is we can take this formula uh, and expand it in a power series in time. Um, and so I'll tell you some features of this power series. So uh, this power series is naturally thought of as a genus expansion. So I've written the, the series as a, a sum over G, G is the genus. Um, and the powers that appear in this expansion are two, T to the two G plus one. And the coefficient at genus G is some polynomial in beta. Um, and there's this uh, interesting formula for that polynomial right here. So this is gonna be sort of key for this talk is uh, the fact that the poly this, this polynomial has, uh, it's the, it basically you pick out the pole of this function here, the, the one over E pole, where this function has a row to the two G. So the idea is that our genus G term in the, in the convergent power series for K beta uh, uh, comes from the E equals zero pole of this thing. And this, this combination, T to the 2G plus one over rho to the 2G is going to be very important in this talk. We're gonna look for another way in which we can find this combination appearing uh, in JT gravity, and that'll give us some inspiration for how to compute this in, uh, in JT. How do we know this formula for PG? Um, yeah, so uh, maybe we'll go back to the slide. So, well, to, to derive it, you write the minimum function as uh, uh, using a as a discontinuity of some logarithm of some stuff. So it'll be an integral uh, along the branch type of logarithm of some discontinuity of logarithm, logarithm. So you write that as a contour integral around the of the log. You expand that in a power series, and then each term. Uh, so this. This would correspond to a term in the power series of those logarithms. Yeah, so th does that answer your question? Okay. Um, and so some final remarks here. Uh, for, so this, this, I've just given a bit of a rough argument for why we expect this to be a good formula for the spectral form factor in this cow scale limit. Um, but we can actually check by doing some uh, low genus computations in JT gravity by using topological recursion. and. We can compute uh, using topological recursion, and we find a match to this formula with the appropriate p betas of g's. Um, and also for the low energy limit of GT gravity, which I'll discuss it a little bit more later, where you take the density of states to be simply a square root of these. Uh, there's exact formulas for that model uh, due to these people, um, and you can check this tau scaled uh, uh, conjecture against it and finding an exact match. Um, the density of states at the disk level, so this this inch. Uh, yes, yes. Um, so the goal for the rest of this talk is to try to understand what is the uh, what is the explanation in JT gravity of this this convergent series. Um, we'll, we'll, while we won't be able to explain it in, in totality, we'll get some hint at where it's coming from. Um, Oh, and also some extra comments about this series. Uh, so we, we saw that the powers of T came at, uh, the T came at powers of 2G plus one. Um, but by naive power counting, uh, you, you'd actually expect uh, that powers of, of T to the 3G might be allowed. Um, 
So instead you get like T to the 2G times powers of beta. Uh, and this was discussed uh, by Yorick actually some time ago. Um, and there are a couple of papers about it uh, in which they, they study these cancellations and they turn out to be related to intricate cancellations uh, and some structure in the Vay peterson volumes. And um, I'm not gonna talk too much about that perspective in this talk, but I just wanted to mention it. So there's, so there's, there's a bunch of cancellations uh, that are necessary to make this, this uh, powers show up at T to the 2G plus one. If they showed up at, power, at higher powers, then you wouldn't get a uh, sensible tau scale limit. So it's very important that there are these cancellations. Um, and, but another comment that I wanna make, which is pretty relevant for this talk is that uh, you might've thought that there's no genus expansion in this uh, ramp plateau structure. So the T is uncorrected up until the plateau and the, then the plateau is uncorrected. Um, but you can do something a little silly maybe, which is just expand this guy in a power series and so write the minimum function using a theta function, expand the theta function, you get derivatives of delta functions of the, of the density of states. So you can think about this function as a power series in T with the coefficients or derivatives of delta functions of the density of states. And so, and that way you can think about these, uh, these higher powers of times as coming from some zero energy contribution. Um, and at zero energy, the plateau time, because the, the plateau happens at uh, T equals density of states. So when the density of states is small, the plateau happens at an early time. So in that sense, we can think about this genus expansion as coming from uh, the fact that th at low energies, the plateau is happening uh, very, at very early times. Okay, so while our goal is to explain this genus expansion for K-beta, we're gonna take a small detour first um, and discuss another aspect of the genus expansion in JT gravity, which is also related to the, this random matrix behavior. Um, and this, this is the, uh, the series of corrections to the ramp in the GOE class. So while ordinary JT gravity corresponds to the GUE uh, class and does not have any uh, perturbative corrections to the ramp for K-E of T, we can make JT part of the GOE class by allowing non-orientable space facts. Um, and so I have written here a formula for KE of T uh, for the GOE. So this formula is only valid for T before the plateau. After the plateau, you have a, a different function. Um, and so this function, we can expand in a power series in T. And we can see that the powers of T show up as T to the 2G plus one with coefficients rho to the 2G where G is now allowed to be half integer because we're considering non-orientable space maps. So we see in this, there's another appearance of this combination, T to the 2G plus one over rho to the 2G. And so we might think, okay, this is a hint. If we can understand where this series is coming from in JT gravity, perhaps we can understand where we get this series for K beta of T because it has a similar combination of terms. So before going on to JT gravity, we're actually gonna take another detour, which is to explain this GOE series in a different context. So I'm gonna review uh, what's known as the uh, theory of encounters in periodic orbits. So the, the systems we're gonna consider are things like a, 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 the, a particle in a chaotic potential or in some billiards table like this. Uh, uh, maybe a better example is, uh, is, is something described by the Selberg trace formula, where it's a particle on a quotient of hyperbolic space. Um, so for these systems, the, the, the motion is, is classically chaotic. Um, and if you quantize, you, you'll find these random matrix uh, statistics and their energy levels and the same ramp and plateau and stuff in, their, in the spectral form factor. Um, for these systems, we can use a nice version of the path integral to study the spectral form factor. So by Writing the path integral and uh, just summing over the different saddle points, which correspond to classical periodic orbits, we can write the, an expression for Ke of t known as the Gutzmiller trace formula. So here, the sum is over pairs, uh, pairs of orbits, one for each copy of the system. There's a one loop term here, which is not going to be very important for us. And then there's an action term. So it's uh, e to the i s of gamma minus s of gamma prime because it's the uh, uh, trace of e to the plus iht times trace of e to the minus iht. Um, and an important fact here is that this, this is uh, a semi-classical formula where the semi-classical limit here means high energies. Um, 
And just to keep in the back of your head, the things we were studying with K-beta correspond to low energy. So this won't necessarily be directly related, but we'll see some sort of connection. What's supposed to be the validity of this formula? So um, for a generic system, it's it's hard to really make sense of it because I like to keep in mind only the subgroup trace formula sometimes, where, where it, this is a, an exact formula. Um, it, it has surprising success for other systems. In the, it, by that, I mean that this, this formula seems, plus the encounter theory, seems to predict the correct, the expected ramp and plateau in the spectral form factor. You might think it wouldn't make sense, but it predicts something which you expect to be correct. Um, but that's, that's all I can really say about it for more general systems. The reason that's all you say is that there's no small parameter that justifies the one that approximation. Yes, yes. Um, so let's look at this, this formula here. Uh, for really long orbits, uh, which we're considering long times, the actions will be very large. So this factor here will be like a random looking phase unless uh, the, the orbits are uh, have some sort of correlated actions. So we're going to focus here on uh, orbit pairs where the actions are correlated and expect that all other orbit pairs will be, their contribution will be averaged out and killed. Um, so I'm going to just check on my slide numbers so I can make sure. Um, okay, so at leading order, we're going to do the simplest thing, which is just take uh, consider act, uh, orbit pairs where the actions are the same. So we can do this by considering orbit pairs that are the same or related by time reversal. Um, and this set of orbit pairs gives this linear ramp in the spectral form factor. And the way that happens is that uh, this, the actions obviously cancel, so we don't get a phase here. And uh, some combination of the one loop terms and the sum over orbits with this. Uh, number of orbits is, is determined by periodicity, um, gives you this linear ramp. And we can roughly think about the, the linear growth, the factor of T, as coming from orbits uh, that, are, uh, that differ just by a relative time shift. So there is a close analogy between what's going on with the orbits and what's happening with the, the wormhole. That the, the factor of T, the linear growth, comes from uh, summing over relative time shifts between two pops of the system. Uh, to go further, we and study this series of corrections to the spectral form factor, we focus on pairs of orbits where they closely follow each other, um, except for certain small off-shell regions known as encounters. So they're not quite periodic orbits, but uh, uh, they're just very, very slightly off-shell. Um, so here is the simplest example of an encounter. It's called the Sieber-Richter pair, but often I'll refer to it as the two encounter, and we'll see why. Um, so this pair uh, contributes only to the GUE ensemble, but not the GOE ensemble, not the GUE. We can see that because uh, uh, on this part of the, uh, the orbit, the, uh, the, two, the two particles are following each other, but here they're anti-parallel. So uh, orbits only exist like this with uh, the actions canceling here uh, if there's a time reversal symmetry. Um, so the, the difference in actions between these two orbit pairs only comes from this small region. And here, uh, what's going on is that this dotted black orbit, it's crossing itself at a small angle, while the red orbit is narrowly avoiding crossing. Um, and what's important is that in this region, uh, all the pieces of orbit are very close in phase space up to time reversal. Um, and that's, that's why it turns out to be why they have a, a small action difference. So, to sum over the contributions of these sort of orbits, we want to parameterize them in a certain way. So the way we're going to parameterize them is one by the time, we'll call it T stretch, which is the duration of, say, just this section of the orbit between the encounter and itself. The total uh, length is fixed to be T, so we won't have to separately uh, parameterize the length of that region. We also have to parameterize what's going on inside the encounter, which we'll do by uh, uh, describing it in terms of Phase space separation variables U and S. So U, which is stands for unstable, describes the phase space separation between this red segment and this black segment. So it's growing in this direction, which we'll think of as time. 
Uh, we also have an S variable, which is state, which uh, stands for stable. That's the, the phase space separation between this red part and this dotted one. And this is shrinking. Um, and in this encounter, we define this encounter region roughly by saying it's the region where the deviations are small enough that we can trust the linearized uh, equations of motion. And with these linearized equations of motion, S and U grow or decay exponentially with the Oppenov exponent lambda. Um, so an encounter means that it's close enough to the picture you've got to make what you said true. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And there, so there's some cutoff on the S and U where it stops being trustworthy, and the calculations we'll see end up not depending sensitively to the on this cutoff. Um, there are also orbits on the other side somehow where the exactly what I mean. This where some dynamical systems you might have an orbit that two separate orbits rather than one that is uh, I'm confused about what you mean. So uh, do you mean an orbit that's okay yeah maybe I'll ask you that okay um so I won't go too much detail into the computation of the contribution of this, this orbit pair to the spectral form factor. I just want to point out a few ingredients which, we'll need, which we would need to compute it because they'll have analogs and JT gravity. First is that the duration of the encounter uh, is fixed in terms of S and U and Lyapunov exponent and some uh, constant C, which C is just a cutoff on the regime of validity of the encounter. So there's some function and the point is that it depends uh, like a log of S times U. And also S times U is the action difference of this pair of orbits. So T encounter is like log of action difference. Um, we also ha have to know the probability of an encounter to happen within some window of S, U, and uh, T stretch. And it's, it's given to just by this formula. And the important part of it goes as like one over rho of E. Rho V is a volume of base space. So uh, the reason we, we get rho, one over rho V is there's like a one over rho V chance for an orbit to come back to itself. And so uh, if we uh, take the self of this uh, Goose trace formula, plug in these various things into, the, uh, into it and integrate over S, U, and T stretch um, when the encounter occurs and this relative time trip between the orbits, we find um, exactly the expected term. So this, this is T to the 2G plus one over rho to the 2G where G equals one half. Um, and what's important here is that there's a minus sign. So this was, what you get by expanding that log formula I gave earlier for the, the, our, the GOE spectral form factor. So here, where is the minus sign coming from? Um, so we integrate over the, the, the T stretch, which is this, the length of this part of the orbit. And the T stretch is integrated from zero up to T minus two T encounter because uh, this, the longest, oops, sorry. The longest this can be is t minus 2t encounter because you have to know that the encounter takes up some of the uh, time. Um, in the integral over s and u, this part is killed and this part, part survives. So there is some cancellation of a, like, a, what would have been a, a t cube, and you're left with a t squared with a minus sign. Um, so now to the GUE, uh, GUE class, the simplest encounters you find. Um, are a combination of are, are, uh, two two encounters and a, a three encounter. So now I'm calling it a three encounter because there's three pieces of the orbit which are coming mutually close. Um, so we, if you look at these pictures carefully, you can see that everywhere along it, the black dotted orbit is following the red orbit. So it contributes to the uh, GUE class. Um, and it turns out that uh, if you compute the contribution of these uh, two encounter pairs, um, using similar ideas to what we saw for the two encounter, you find these contributions. You find t to the 2g plus one over rho to the 2g, or g equals one. But uh, this one has a positive sign, and this one has a negative sign. Uh, and if you sum over them, they exactly cancel. So you find that these two encounters do not give you a correction to the GUE spectral form factor. And furthermore, if you, it has been shown that to all orders, um, if you sum over the encounters for the GUE class, they exactly cancel. If you sum over the encounters for the GOE class, they produce precisely the series you need uh, for the uh, RMT formula. And this is some really amazing work by, by these folks 
turned up. Um, so these encounters, they have, they, they, they show up with these sort of uh, uh, contributions, but they exactly cancel in the GUV. Um, so you might be a little bit pessimistic that something like this can, uh, can uh, help us explain this, this series for K beta. Um, and just to, to say where we're going to get to, roughly the idea is we're going to see at least at, at some low genus simple examples, the low energy, there's some low energy corrections to the, the encounters which spoil their cancellation. So we'll find a genus one in JT gravity at low energies. This cancellation is disturbed and you get to the correct prediction for this K beta. Um, but we'll get to that after, after fleshing this out a little bit more in, in, in JT gravity. Um, so yeah, for the rest of the talk, uh, we're just going to discuss an analog of the two encounter in JT gravity. So what we just saw, and then we're going to study the uh, uh, G equals one uh, case in, in uh, this area limit of JT gravity that I mentioned earlier. Um, we'll, we'll see this thing I just said that the some certain low energy corrections to the encounters spoil this cancellation, uh, giving us the term we want. So the, the idea uh, to make, so let's make a, a dictionary between encounters and uh, configurations in JT gravity. So the idea is that uh, if we, in one side of the dictionary, we have segments of orbits following each other. Uh, in the gravity side of the dictionary, we have segments of boundary that are uh, close in the wormhole geometry. So for the cylinder geometry, that was in the orbit picture, that was two, two orbits that were following each other very closely. In the wormhole geometry, you had a cylinder where points along the boundary are close to, uh, to each other if they're across the wormhole, but not if they're somewhere else for a far away in the wormhole. So for these encounters, uh, we have multiple segments of the, we'll, we'll call one boundary red, one, one boundary black. Multiple segments become mutually close all at once. So we can make a, a picture by, let's draw this, uh, this encounter region for orbits. Uh, and here's what becomes one boundary and another segment of the other boundary. Let's twist this picture to get something like this and then fill in the region between the two boundaries. This gives us a surface here. So what we're gonna look for in GT gravity is a surface that has a region that looks like this locally. Um, and then to make it a two encounter these parts here have to be connected together to give us the right topology with two circular boundaries. So I've got a bit of an ugly picture here and a less ugly picture. Um, so this is supposed to be a picture of the uh, two encounter contribution to JT gravity. So this is a non-orientable surface. Um, and we can think about it as a cylinder with a cross cut inserted onto it. So what this picture is supposed to um, show you is that there's, there's regions along the block and red boundaries where if you don't, you can just go across the cylinder. So this point will be close to this point. This point will be close to it. You should think about it as going around the other side, but close to this point. But then there's segments of the boundary here where to go across, you need to go through the cross cap. And it will turn out that the, the segment that's sort of near the cross cap is anti-parallel to the segment on the other side of the cross cap. Um, we can see that a little bit more clearly by drawing this surface as some quotient of the hyperbolic disk. So in JD gravity, uh, all these surfaces, we can think of this, this quotient of the hyperbolic disk. And there's some asymptotic boundaries here. Um, and we can roughly see that if we follow, where is the red? This is a Euclidean picture, so this is slightly misleading, but you can get the, the point across. If you follow some part of the red boundary and ask, where is it closest to? Which part of the black boundary is it closest to? Here, the black boundary is closest to this part of, sorry, this part of the red boundary is closest to this part of the black boundary. But then as you move along in time, it suddenly jumps to being closer to this part of the black boundary. So that's what's going on here. As this part of the red boundary starts out being closer to this part of the black boundary, but then it jumps to being closer to this part of the black boundary. So this is, this is a Euclidean version of, uh, this is Euclidean geometry where the pattern of correlation between, the pattern of distances between pairs of points on the boundary mimics this pattern of uh, closeness of the encounter orbits. Um, so what we want to do in JT gravity is we take 
this surface has uh, there's a there's a modular space of these surfaces, and there's also we have to integrate over the boundary wiggles. We integrate over all these surfaces. We want to see that it produces the expected in, uh, GOE spectral form factor contribution matching with the encounter. Um, so on this surface, there's a few parameters. There's some closed geodesics B. Uh, there's a there's B one, B two, A and A prime, where only three of these guys are independent. Um, and the question is, is it important that it can diverge sometimes? Uh, pardon me? The cross cap. Um, you integrate over the size of the cross cap that you get diverge. Oh, oh yeah. so the divergence <laughs> comes from when this cross cap is small. And roughly the tau scale limit focuses on large circles. So the basically the, 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 the divergent part that is proportional to this, the part that, that's divergent. Uh, doesn't grow in time. So we can think about it as unimportant at long times. Um, yeah, but I, I wasn't going to mention really the, uh, the divergence. It's in, yes, yeah. Okay. Um, so I'll just really briefly hit the essential points on the JT version of this, of this two encounter. Um, so we have to integrate over the boundary wiggles and three of these geodesic lengths. Um, so fixing the energy to compute Ke of t fixes the, the sum of the, of the Bs. Uh, th those are geodesics which are homologous to the boundaries. Um, a little bit more simply seen here. So those are the sum of the Bs is proportional to t. Um, short chain integral over the boundary fluctuations gives the uh, action term, where now the action is like the, uh, the difference in the Bs. So the B is sort of like the Square root of E is like the uh, S gamma. So it's like the action of one of the orbits is proportional to B. Um, so uh, an encounter corresponds to having B1 near B2. Um, it, I won't be able to explain this point in detail, but these other geodesics, A and A prime, are essentially the phase space separations S and U. I just want to point out that you can identify these, these S and U as a very direct analog in, in, the, in the wormhole geometry. Um, and finally, if you integrate over the moduli of these, this uh, cross cap wormhole, uh, it produces a factor which mimics this uh, t minus t encounter uh, integral over the moduli of the encounter. Except now we find a formula for t encounter, which looks like this. So uh, in the ordinary encounter, you had a one over Lyapunov exponent here. So this is actually what you get by computing the, the Lyapunov exponent JT gravity using the OTOC 4 point function. So that matches. Now you find a log of one over cinch of delta action. Uh, in the ordinary encounter, it was, there was no cinch. It was just a log of one over delta action. So for small delta action, which is when the encounter computation is valid, uh, it matches the JT formula. But now the JT formula is sort of valid beyond that limit. And that's, that's basically the important point. Um, so JT gravity, we don't have to consider uh, geometries which uh, only look like the encounter because we have, we have uh, control beyond uh, uh, the limit where the action, delta S is small. So here delta S is like proportional to delta B. We have control when delta B is large. Um, so what that means in the learn to mean picture is, so B1 minus B2 is proportional to T1 minus T2, where T1 and T2 are the uh, periods of the two boundaries. So just to clear that up for a moment, we've the spectral form factor is Z of beta plus IT times Z of beta minus IT. Beta can have an imaginary part. So the imaginary part of beta is the is the uh, 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 so the, the two time the two Lorentzian uh, durations of the boundary are T plus imaginary part of beta and T minus imaginary part of beta. So the imaginary part of beta gives a gives a time difference between the two boundaries. So they don't exactly have the same duration. Um, so on the previous slide, I told you that the uh, action difference is proportional to delta B. In the semi-classical limit, we want to consider small action differences. Um, in the encounter theory, we thought the semi-classical li limit also meant large energies. Um, but here, if the energy is small, you can have large delta B and still have a small action. Uh, 
And for the ordinary encounters, we don't have control over that re regime, but in JT, we do. And so that's going, that's important because as I was telling you earlier, K beta of T, this genus expansion roughly thing is coming from this small energy regime. So our ability in JT gravity to basically like consider the, the encounters beyond their ordinary regime ability down to low energies is going to allow us to compute encounters at low energies and see if they do or do not cancel in K beta. Um, and what happens is that corrections beyond just the ordinary encounter uh, computations uh, spoil the GUE cancellation. So now just to see how that works, we're not going to study this in full JT gravity. We're going to consider a simplified limit. Um, and I'll explain that by, also, the way I'll explain that is by starting out by saying that if you can take, you can take any of these two-sided wormhole geometries in JT gravity and split them up as follows. So we can take the right asymptotic boundary and the left asymptotic boundary and cut off trumpets uh, that connect to some surface along some circular geodes XB1 and um, And in the middle, we have some geometry. It's got two geodesic boundaries and it's got some number of handles on it. Uh, and the spectral form factor uh, is given by an integral over the length of these geodesics B1 and B2, times some factor, which is just the integral over the, uh, uh, the boundary wiggles on the left and the right trumpets, times the volume of the moduli space of these surfaces in the middle. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to look at a low energy limit of JT gravity, where we can do that by taking beta and time really large. So that focuses on low energies, where the density of states becomes like a square root of the energy. And in this formula, we can see that focusing on large beta means focusing on large B1 and B2. So the lengths are becoming very large. Um, if you take the limit of these uh, volumes of the moduli spaces, uh, these are some polynomials in the B1 and B2. Focusing on the limit of large lengths means just taking the, the, leading, uh, the leading terms in these polynomials. And uh, uh, so you get a nice simple formula for the, this low energy limit of JT gravity, uh, which is this, this formula, but we've replaced this volume of the moduli space by uh, a limiting version, which we'll call V airy. And uh, the airy, this, this limit of JT gravity is often referred to as the airy model, though I don't really have time to explain why. Um, no, the main point though, is that it's a version of JT gravity where all the links of these surfaces are, uh, all the links of all these geodesics are extremely large. And so that is very useful because uh, the surfaces with large boundary links are thin strips. So let's, we're gonna focus here just on this middle part. Um, it has two geodesic boundaries. Uh, and so we can use the uh, Gauss-Binet theorem uh, to show that the area of that surface in the middle is fixed in terms of its Euler character and the uh, constant negative curvature, which is two or minus two in this case. I think there should be an absolute value. But uh, um, the idea is that if you have these surfaces and they have very, very long boundaries, but a fixed area, they have to be thin strips. And in this limit of surfaces that are thin strips, there's a very nice decomposition of the moduli space of these surfaces due to Konsevich, where a given graph, sorry, a given surface uh, uh, can be represented by a cubic ribbon graph. Um, and the, the edges of this graph are given lengths. So here I've drawn an example where this is a cubic ribbon graph where there's two boundaries. There's a black dotted boundary and a red boundary. And this is supposed to be a literal like picture of the geometry in this, uh, this long length limit. So at all, along all points of this geom uh, along all points of the boundary, uh, the red boundary is either really close to the black boundary or really close to itself. So all these surfaces in this limit are correspond to some graph where the graph is a literal picture of the geometry. And to integrate over these surfaces, over the moduli space of these surfaces, we just integrate over the lengths of the edges of the graph with a flat measure. So it's very, very simple to use these graphs to compute the path integral of these surfaces. So 
as an example, we're just going to look at the genus one half two encounter uh, contribution, where there's simply just four graphs. Uh, this, so these are all all the graphs that have the appropriate topology of the cylinder with a cross cap. Um, I've labeled the graphs by the number of red red edges and black black edges. So either this one has one red red edge and zero black black edges, therefore it's zero and one. Um, so to understand uh, why these graphs are related to encounters, let's let's look at uh, this guy here. So I, if you look at this 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 graph, the, you can you can see very directly that the uh, the red because there's this extra red edge, the red boundary is longer than the black boundary. So to make contact with the encounter picture, let's shrink the red red edge. So the red boundary and the black boundary have approximately the same length. Uh, and focus on this region here. There, the graph looks like this, where we're shrinking this edge. This is actually, there should be an over two here. Um, so what's going on in this region of the graph is that there's pieces of the boundaries, which are mutually close, but then they, they switch. So the black boundary switches, which part of the red boundary is close to. That's exactly mimicking what's going on with the encounter. Um, and outside of this middle region of the graph, the red and the black boundaries are following each other just as they would in an encounter. So this surface corresponding to this graph looks like a Euclidean version of the encounter geometry. Um, this one does as well, except now that this, now uh, the black black uh, edge is, uh, is, has some finite length uh, instead of the red red one. Um, so, for all of these graphs, these two sort of should obviously resemble the encounters. These ones also we should think of as part of the encounter, though I don't have much time to explain that. Um, so just take it on faith that these are also, uh, there's a way to think of these as part of the encounter. Um, Can you remind me what the difference is between red and black in the basic uh, discussion? Uh, so the red and blacks are, are literally just the, the okay. yeah. So, and just because along the trumpet, the the asymptotic boundary follows the, the geodesic boundary. You can think of that as sort of where the boundary lives in a heuristic way. Um, so the main point here is that the, these graphs, they look like encounters, except they, they resolve the encounter for finite delta B. And as I was saying earlier, at low energies, finite delta B is important. So this, these, the way in which these encounters are resolved is going to become important. So now I'm, I'm going to show you what happens at genus one. At genus one, in Ke of t, we expect all the encounters to cancel, but we don't expect a total cancellation in K beta. Um, so we're going to see how the, what the graphs are doing differently uh, uh, in this case to spoil the cancellation. So there's a lot of confusing looking graphs here. And I'll try to demystify it really quickly. So this graph here, we have two, two encounters. So here are the two encounter is resolved by a red, red line. Here it's resolved by a black, black line. So it's labeled one, one. Here are those two, two encounters where they're each resolved by red, red. This thing here, I'll explain in a moment, is like a three encounter. And these are the limits of the three encounter. These arrows represent, there's a simple way to generate all the set of graphs with a given topology by uh, uh, doing some sort of simple operation on a given edge. So you start with one graph, do what's called a cross operation on one of the edges, that'll give you a new graph, and you can make all the, the set of graphs by crossing various edges. Um, but that's very, not very important for us. Um, so these are, these are two two encounters, and, the, and there's a three encounter here. So let's look real quick at this, this part of this graph. You can draw it like this. So there's a, there's a place where the pairs of red and black boundaries come together, and the red boundaries uh, form this sort of shape here. If you rearrange it, you can see that what's going on is that the pairs of red and black boundaries are exchanging which ones they're matched with in this sort of pattern. And that's exactly what uh, a three encounter does. It's similar to a two encounter where uh, two pairs exchange which one they're, they're following. In a three encounter, three pairs exchange who they're following in this way. So to summarize, there's a bunch of these graphs, and then there's, there's more graphs where you replace the red, red ones with the black, black ones. And together, all those graphs can be sorted into two, two encounters and a three encounter. But because the system is very simple and it's easy to compute the volumes of the moduli space of these surfaces, we can just 
straight up compute the contribution to k beta of t from a given set of graphs. So if we take all the, the two, two encounter graphs and compute the contribution of the spectral form factor k with the fixed beta and a tau scale limit, we get this guy here. So there's a t cubed, that's t to the 2g plus 1. But now there's a, there's a log t and there's a minus 1. So how do we interpret this? So the idea is that um, uh, for finite energies and long times, when the encounter approximation is valid and the delta B is small, uh, those, two, those same graphs would give this contribution to Ke of t. So they would give a t cubed over E. This is really only valid when E is much bigger than one over T. For sufficiently low energies, this approximation breaks down and the encounters are resolved and you get something that doesn't grow in time. This formula is not accurate. So we can estimate the contribution of these two two encounters to K beta by taking the encounter formula and integrating over energy, but cutting off the energy integral at this low energy where the encounter seems to be valid. And that would give a formula like this. So we integrate over energy with a uh, low energy cutoff. You have a Boltzmann weight, and here's the two two encounter formula. And it gives this guy here. So this exactly matches the exact formula. But now there's a, there's a cutoff dependent term because we don't really know how to cut, up, how to cut it up properly. So what's going on is the full theory can determine the cutoff uh, and fix this constant here. We, if we can do the same thing for the three encounter, uh, uh, computer's exact answer, it looks similar to this. Do the same thing where we uh, take the encounter formula, integrate over energies with a low energy cutoff, and it gives us a formula very similar to this. If we add the two, we find that the logarithm of key terms cancel, but there's a constant, these, these cutoff dependent constant terms do not cancel. So what's going on is that the, the logarithm terms, the log of t terms, they cancel between the two two encounters and the three encounter for the same reason that encounters cancel at uh, finite energy. But these cutoff dependent terms do not cancel between the encounters because the two two encounters and the three encounter are resolved in different ways. There's no reason that they should cancel. So here, the, the three encounter is resolved by having this extra cubic vertex in the middle, and the two, the two encounters are resolved in this way. It's, you get a very different answer at low energies for those two different graphs. They only really are should cancel at high energies when the, when they don't need to be resolved. Can I ask um, a question? <clears throat> yes. Um, so do these terms? I know these terms. You said these terms cancel out each other in GUE, giving the ramp. Yeah. So when you sum over these terms in G uh, in this GOE case. Does it give the RAM or does it also give the RAM and plateau? Do you have to sum over all terms to get a plateau? Um, um, all so, encounters? Yeah. So uh, maybe I'll try to. So, okay. So, starting with the GUE case, at fixed energy, you only expect a, a ramp uh, from the genus expansion and no plateau from the genus expansion. At fixed beta, there's a convergent genus expansion. Or if you sum over all the terms, you get a function that smoothly plateaus at late times. Um, because I thought the plateau is non-perturbative. So yeah, um, so so that's the trick with this this k beta here. Using the fixed temperature thing, it the plateau is a comes from a convergent series instead of I see. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thanks. <clears throat> so it maybe just says that I, I didn't write any exact formulas, but in this area limit. This, the spectral form factor, it's an error function of like t times, it's a, and it's an error function of t. So it, it starts off going linearly and then it smoothly uh, flattens out at late times. Um, and so here, here we're just computing the leading correction to the ramp in that, in that power series there. Okay, so we, we saw this, 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 uh, the, this failure of the cancellation of the encounters a genus one in the area limit. But what about going to higher genus or considering other rho of E? So for example, the full JT value here, not just this low energy limit. So as I said earlier, K beta has this, this power series uh, where the P's, these coefficients are given by something like this. Where this is picking out the one over E pole uh, uh, in this combination here. 
So we can try to uh, mimic this uh, cutoff encounter thing by you take the formula for an encounter uh, in uh, a general genus for general density of states and uh, do this energy integral, but we, where we cut it off at some, some uh, small energy. It goes as one over T. Uh, so this is a big nasty integral, but we can see that there's going to be a contribution which goes like log of T over beta that comes from the one over E pole in this combination. And that log over T, log of T will have a coefficient which is like T to the two G plus one times P of G. But then there will be some, some uh, coefficient which will depend on the exact encounter. There will be a constant term here which depends on how we cut off the encounter. We'll also get higher powers of T. So by taking these encounters more generally and integrating over energies with this low energy cutoff, you can see the right terms appear. You can see the terms we need in K beta appearing, but we don't know how to fix their coefficient and we don't know why the higher powers of T work. So in this genus one example, to fix these coefficients in the exact formula, we needed to integral over like the full set of geometries. We needed to integrate over geometries where this is a, is a large region, uh, for example. So it's not clear in, in, in that computation why there should be any universality uh, uh, of the, the cutoff regime, uh, the cutoff region. Why, why are we getting the right coefficients from, a, uh, from this low energy cutoff uh, computation? So that's basically the main question going forward with this work. Um, while the encounter picture where we cut it off at low energies seems to be producing the right, not just the right power of T, but also the, the right beta dependence of the coefficients, getting the right coefficients, which is very important, uh, uh, we don't know how to do. And there's no, it's, it's not clear why the cutoff should have some sort of universal flavor to it. Um, so, uh, the question of why is low energy regime universal, like related to some other recent work on this topic by uh, Jura and others, and uh, in, in Germany as well. Um, some other remaining questions are the relationship with Lorentzian topology change ge changing geometries that uh, Jura and others also talked about. Um, some of their geometries look that contribute to the spectral form factor look a lot like these encounters if you think about it. Um, so it'd be nice to make a connection precise there. Um, and one last point is uh, there's another just way to another uh, tool in, in the quantum chaos community called the nonlinear sigma model um, used to give some sort of universal uh, uh, computation of the spectral form factor in this random matrix regime. And this nonlinear sigma model also has some connection between the plateau and encounters. And uh, we next understand how uh, this nonlinear sigma model description meshes with these, this uh, K beta convergent expansion uh, computation of spectral form factor. And perhaps that can, understanding the connection better could help explain the universality of this low energy uh, behavior. Uh, yeah, so that's it. Do we have any questions? Why? You comment on the middle point. What, why did the Lorentzian yeah, so the structure geometries look like that? Maybe is so the ones that the example that is relevant. Um, so you start with the the double cone. So this is like um, this is like an orbit pair where the two orbits are following each other. Uh, then you make a a cut somewhere on the left and cut somewhere on the right. And then uh, I, these will be, a, I'll, I'll try to draw it in a little bit. So part of the issue is that these cuts should be near the middle of this geometry, but I'm gonna draw them a finite length away. Yeah. Make two cuts here, and then you identify them. So what's going on is if you're, if you're on the other side of this wormhole and you, uh, and you ask which point on the right boundary which point on the left boundary is this point on the right boundary close to? It's closest to the point just like opposite. Yeah. But if you're considering points on this side of the right boundary, say that are like near this this uh, this cut, the point it's closest to on the left boundary will actually be somewhere like over here. 
So if you look at these geometries where you just you cut them uh, and glue them in the way that with the, the advocate for, um, the pattern of like distances between boundary points matches up with this encounter picture. It's just either the segments of the boundary are parallel or anti-parallel, but they sort of switch where they're where they're where they're close to. Uh, but what they did is like a semi-classical computation where this you don't see anything, any hint of this like uh, the shockwave mode physics in this in this the edge of these these guys. So we, maybe you have to do a little bit more of a like complicated version of what they're doing to, to see it matching counters there. Um, oh, maybe one slide which I'll what time is it? Uh, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll just bring up one other slide. I just wanted to briefly point out that so. Uh, these encounters, they, I've drawn a picture here of a two encounter, but I also want to interpret it as, a, as this picture as, a, as the OTOC four point function. So the idea of the OTOC four point function is you have uh, four copies of the system. You start out with one pair highly correlated and another pair highly correlated. So usually in the OTOC, it's, you start them in the maximally entangled state by like this path and you a closed time contour, and you put an operator there to, to make them not quite maximally entangled. So you have these two copies of the system, two, two pairs of copies of the system, highly correlated here and highly correlated here. And then you, you ask what's the, what's the amplitude for them to evolve into this other set of highly correlated pairs, but where they're paired up differently. Uh, so in gravity, if you compute this thing, uh, there's a simple effective theory in terms of shock, drain to hoof shock wave modes. In the encounters, uh, you have a similar uh, setup going on where you have pairs of cop pairs of copies of the system uh, that are that start out highly correlated but switch who they're correlated with, and the description of that is in terms of these S and U modes. And I just wanted to point out that those are the same thing, really. And you can make that a lot more precise in this JT gravity example, as, as we did in our paper. That uh, these these uh, S and U modes in the encounters are the shock wave modes in, in gravity. Oh. Okay. okay. Um, any, any, any last questions? If not, then let's thank very much. Thank you.